whenever you're ready. And welcome. You know, here in academic programs, and certainly with Center for Neurotechnology Studies, one of the things we're very, very interested in doing is creating academic and collaborative outreach. Over the years, we've had opportunities to work with a number of different universities, a variety of different institutions, and a number of academic and technological partners, both within the, the national sphere and, and internationally as well, certainly. And the idea is to broaden horizons and also bring new insights on board. Well, today we have a very special opportunity in that, of course, the discussions here at the Institute over the past several months have focused on leveraging science and technology on the world stage. Of course, those areas of the world stage that tend to be of most importance are those that also have ongoing economic development that is leverageable internationally and speaks also to various agendas that range from public life through medicine through national security of those countries. Certainly China is representative and is going to be a player, not only in today's international neuro and biological technological market, but increasingly as we move into the future where we have scientific, academic, and intellectual sharing, exchanges, and movement towards true convergence, not only in the scientific sphere, but increasingly as part of a larger international and public dialogue. Well, Today's lecture brings that to the fore. And obviously, one of the things that's important for us is to maintain a set of collaborations with our domestic partners in bringing such events as we have here today to the Potomac Institute. In that light, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor John Shook. Dr. Shook is at the Center for Inquiry. He's also here with us as a visiting fellow for a two-year period working with me at CNS, developing some projects in neuroethics, and he's also doing some work now at the George Mason University. He also teaches at the University of Buffalo Science and Society program. So without further ado, and to introduce our speaker today, please welcome Professor John Shook. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be able to work with um, uh, Dr. Jim Giordano and CFI and uh, the Potomac Institute through his uh, program here in uh, neurotechnology and ethics. We're designing some interesting programming. He and I both teach for the graduate program that you mentioned, the, uh, the uh, science and society program. Um, it's called uh, Science and the Public. It's a concentration available as a master's in education from the University of Buffalo, entirely online, so it's very convenient to be able to offer creative courses. Jim taught the neuroethics course for us. The Center for Inquiry is a not-for-profit educational and advocacy um, think tank, if you will, and also outreach organization. We advocate science, reason, and humanistic values in the United States, and we also have had long-standing partnerships around the world. So we extend this opportunity to various sorts of countries, and we have had contacts and partnering relationships with science, skepticism, and humanistic organizations all around the world, many, many countries. One of our long-standing relationships is with China. And the Center for Inquiry began its relationship with Chinese scholars, and especially the uh, uh, CRISP, the, the Chinese Research Institute for Science Popularization, which brings us our current speaker. That long-standing relationship that now goes back many, many years has seen American uh, scientists and skeptics go to China to lecture on such things as pseudoscience, medicine, the popularization of science, and the accurate communication about science. We've held joint congresses for many years, both I think in Shanghai and Beijing, perhaps. And we also host Chinese scholars from time to time here in America. This year, we are delighted to host Dr. Shang Ximin, and she is going to be talking to us about her research with CRISP, the overall aims of CRISP, and some of her particular um, uh, understandings of the history, trajectory, and current issues in science communication. So please help me welcome Dr. Zheng Ximin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me this chance to make this presentation. Uh, yes, I'm from China Research Institute of Science Popularization. Um, before I came here, I learned I learned a lot of things uh, about Potomac Institute. That I found that these two insti institutes do have many things in common. Like we are both a non-for-profit research institute. We both do research in 
that about um, policies. That is, we both uh, focus on new technology, science, and uh, national security uh, issues, and we both seek extensive collaboration with similar organizations. So, so I hope I, I will give a interesting presentation here. So the topic of my presentation is science communication in China. I know that within a 45 minutes, it's impossible to give a whole image of science communication in China, but I will try to give more information about uh, what people are doing in the science communication field in China. So this is maybe the contents of my presentation. First, I will give a brief introduction of evolution of science communication in China, then introduction of the past, Chris, and my work and my reflection on science communication. So first of all, I, I want to illustrate two terms, science popularization and the science communication. Academically, in China, scholars do think that there are some difference between these two terms. When we say science popularization, that means a knowledge come from side of scientist to public, but public is supposed to be ignorant, and they won't uh, react to the scientists. They, there, there isn't any dialogue between them. But when you say science communication, that means there will be a two-way interactive communication between scientists and the public. Not only the scientists can disseminate knowledge to the public, but also the public can, can have the right to say whether science is bad or good. There is a dialogue between them. So why I explain this here, because mm -hmm. I agree that there are differences between SP and IC, but in my presentation, uh, in this context, I consider them the same because uh, we can just ignore the, the difference between the terms. I mean, what, whether they call it SP or SC, it doesn't mind because we are doing the same things. We are just commuting science to the public. Yeah. And so let's start with the evolution of science communication in China. I, it's, it's the truth that Asian China school education lacked science education. The earliest public school in China can be traced back to Xia Dynasty, which is about 4,000 years ago. During the period from Xia Dynasty to Qing Dynasty, China developed its unique school system, uh, education system. This system highlighted the arts, but almost ignored the science except the math. So this situation lasted until the late 19th century. But what made the changes when it comes to the 19th, late century? I think part of the reason, not I think, it's, it's widely agreed that part, part of the reason is the um, missionaries. Yeah, it's a truth that missionaries from Western countries made contributions to the early science communication in China from 17th century to early 20th century. Missionaries there is a special group. They came to China with religion or political aim. And uh, the religion they brought to China influenced the society. But more importantly, the modern sciences they brought to China influenced the China development too. So I I I didn't figure out how many missionaries were sent to China during that period, but it's a lot, I think. 
Um, and some of the missionaries are very well known by their contributions, such as um, Matthew Rissi, a Union Adam, Goldman Bell, Ferdinando Warbis, and John Fryer. This is natural. Metal with in Chinese is Li Ma Dou. Yeah. And he is the first missionary to China. He arrived in China in 1583, Ming Dynasty. And, uh, and he came there to disseminate Catholic. Metalese's contribution to science in China is in the fields of geography, and geometry, and medicine. Yeah. These three books are the books he translated. This is a world map. This is a geometry, and this is math. And this is Ferdinand of Werbist. And he's a uh, he was sent to China in 1658. He was good at astronomy, calendar, geography, mechanics, and uh, made contributions in this field through writing and inventions. This is a calendar book, map. Uh, this is a book about the Western world. It's Union Adams go one bell. He came to China in 1618 and has been living in China for almost 50 years. He was good at astronomy and calendar canoe building too. So through writing, translation, and invention, he made contributions too. This is a book about telescope. So it's a calendar book. It's uh, about weapon. It's a uh, map, and it's a uh, kind of Oh, this is John Fryer. This is an Englishman. He established the first journal of popular science in China. The journal was called Chinese Scientific Medicine. So um, we can see that. Um, the missionaries made contributions to science in China during that period. Although at that time, most of the books was kept by the officials, scholars in the royal libraries, and the public don't have any, don't have many access to this book. But the missionaries' efforts did contribute to the science communication among the community of scientists. So that was helpful to science communication because it provided the basic sources and uh, it made the government and officials pay more attention to science. So inspired by those missionary efforts and uh, the aspect atmosphere of science at that time. More and more Chinese intellectuals, inventors began to write and translate books on science and technology. So how many books were they translated? And there are some data from 1650s to 1950s. More than 400 Western books was translated. Among them, a 131 are science books. This is religion books. This is a humanity books. And uh, in the last half uh, century of 19th century, about 1,500 books was translated with a great majority is on science and technology. Also, the government start to pay attention to the science learning. So this is a picture of the first group of students who study overseas to America, and Japan, and other uh, countries. So study, I started from 
1872, the Qing Dynasty government began to send students to learn science and Western culture in Western countries. And also, the first university was founded. It was in 
defines a social agent is to promote the development of nations, economy, and culture. And the science association should be aligned to and work with the corresponding sections of the government. Therefore, two organizations were founded in this conference. That was very important. The first one is Federation of Natural Science Societies and National Association for Science Organization. What's the difference between them? Um, yeah, but the federation has society members. The association has the individual scientist members. And the federation aims to uh, promote the scientific research to promote the development of the nation's economy, culture, and military defense. Well, the National Association for Science Popularization aims to promote science popularization to improve the nation's scientific literacy. In April of 1953, there is a, there is a regulation called Instructions on reinforcement on the work of the National Association for Science Popularization. The central government claimed that science communication is important. There will be a great development of science communication for the public. And three years after that, the central government made it clear in a conference that the major alignment of NE. SP was to boost the science communication. In 18, in 1954, the Constitution of the People's Republic of China regulated that the government should develop natural and social sciences and popularize science and technology knowledge. After that, in 1958, the two organizations were combined. That was the past China Association for Science and Technology. There's the conference that announced the establishment of past. So, what is China Association for Science and Technology. It's the largest national non-governmental organization of scientific and technological workers in China. Now it comes to the second part. I will give you an introduction about CAST. The business mission of CAST, boosting the development of science and technology in China, Enhancing science literacy of the whole nation, encourage scientists and the engineers to conduct academic exchange, science popularization, and the scientific and technological consulting and other activities, according to the country's science and technology environmental strategy. Also, safeguarding the legitimate rights of the scientific and the technological workers. That's the mission of the cast. So this shows the structure of cast. A cast on the top was the state level cast. Then it has more than 20 departments which are responsible for different um, different functions. This different function and Chris, Chris was one of them. Um, at previous level, there are more than 30 casts. And uh, it also have cast at city or county levels, more than three thousand. Yep. That's the structure of cast. Also, cast uh, has associations and societies. 
at the national level, there are 181. And uh, more than 500 at the province level, and uh, a lot at the city and county level. So through this structure, through the branches at a different level, so cast maintain a very close ties to the um, Chinese scientists all over the country. And uh, mm, this made cast very strong. So since its inauguration, cast has made significant contributions to the <coughs> uh, development of science and technology among the public. So after, in 1958, CAST was founded, lots of policies were was made too. That was in April 1861, CAST had the National Working Conference, re-emphasized the importance of science communication in rural areas. And in the spring of 1862, Premier Zhou addressed the National Science and Technology Working Conference that CAST still had to maintain academic activity and science communication. And uh, another two symposium was held to exchange the experience of science communication. In March of 1865, the State Council called a National Working Conference on Agriculture Scientific Experiment. So this is a very important affair. Um, just after the policy of opening up, the National Science Conference was convened it proposed that forming a climate of long sense, learning science, and applying science. So guided by the guided by this national conference, the organizations, writings, and the events of science communication all met the new opportunity to develop. So The China Institute for Science Writing was formed in 1980. And that was important because Chris was developed from this science writing association. This is a science writing. At that time, science writing was very prosperous. In 1993, a very important law on scientific and technological progress was, was made. I mean, people say it is the only law on science, science communication in the world. After that, more laws and regulations was made. So, obviously, in this period, with the development of society, China government attached more and more importance to science popularization court. Thus, Science communication policies were more than those in the traditional period, and special science popularization policies arose. And in the picture is the China Science and Technology Museum. So this is the proposal on 
strengthen the construction of science and technology museums and other science popularization and infra infrastructural facilities. And uh, this is no case of further intense intensifying publicity of science popularization. Another two regulations. Another three. So in 2006, the most important outline in the 21st century was was made. That was outline of the national program for long and medium term scientific and technology development. This is outline of the national scheme for scientific literacy. It was issued by the state council and the office of the leading group was that in cast. This is a proposal on, on, on a science communication in rural areas. We revise the law of People's Republic of China on science and technology. Correct. There was proposal on strengthening the ethnic minority science communication. There was outline of instructional development and the science population. On the meeting of the 50th anniversary of CAST, President Hu Jintao addressed and he proposed requirements for science communication course. That was very helpful for the course of science communication in China and the development of CAST. So, we can conclude that since the foundation of People's Republic of China, greatest importance has been attached to science communication. Laws and the regulations were issued, which accelerated the science communication course in China from the aspect of facility organization, team, funds, and so on. All the above mentioned policies have greatly enhanced the development of science popularization in China and uh, made the ever best period of science communication. So now the science communication in China is in the best period of history. So I'll talk more about the outline of the next machine for scientific literacy. Um, this outline set its stage goal as till 2010, science and technology education, science communication developing quickly, science literacy enhancing obviously, reaching the main developed countries development level as in 1980s. And uh, there are nine tasks in this outline, in this social project. They are called the miners scientific literacy action, the farmers scientific literacy action, scientific communication for leading careers, uh, cadres and the public servants, sense education and training project for urban workforce. Sense education and training project. Mm. Popular science and technology capacity building pro promotion project for mass media and the infrastructure project, resources development and the sharing project, and also the supporting conditions, uh, which is about the policies, funds, and the team. So, what's the theme of the whole outline? The whole a social project that was saving the energy and resources, protecting the environment, safeguard the safety and the health, encourage the innovations and uh, 
inventions they are or an effort to make a sustainable development of society. So guided by this policy, I mean by the outline of the scheme uh, of national scientific literacy, uh, lots of activities were launched, like the National Science Day, like the uh, exhibitions of constructing conservative-minded society. Um, I will show you many pictures of that. This is a science day of 2007. So the, the children are, are learning science of what are they? It's gallery. It's the China Digital Science and Technology Museum. That's a workshop. The professor here is called Ilan Chabai. He lives in the system. They have a very good relationship. Uh, Chris and uh, this professor has a very good relationship and uh, collaboration. He brought his uh, exhibits to China and uh, uh, show it at the Science Organization Day. Uh, you can see that the public are very interested in his exhibits. Children are learning sense. People are visiting the China Museum of Science and Technology. <coughs> Workshop for children. Exhibitions. Parents took the baby to the took their kids to the event. Robot. Look, this boy is <laughs> quite cute. <laughs> 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 I think he's interested in the experiment. And uh, there is a training for for the workforce who will go into China, uh, go into the cities for work from the rural area. So a lot of people are training every year. <coughs> introduction about what what is going on in science communication in China. It's just permitting science to the public. So what my institute uh, is focusing on in the whole field of science communication. Yeah. The Chris was uh, founded in 1980, as I said, uh, towards the uh, China Association for Science Writing at the beginning. 
and it's a non-for-profit organization. It's a research institute. It's part of the cost. And uh, it stands as a unique national institution, dealing especially with studies on science and technology communication. So what are we research researching? Yeah, Chris devotes itself to both theoretical and the applicable researches in regards of science communication. And here I list some of the fields we are focusing on, like the target group of science organization, like farmers, youth, leadership groups, and residents in cities. Also, we research the way of science popularization. Um, you may have special research on mass media, internet, and new media. And the mechanism of science popularization are the research too. This is mainly about how the limited resources can be effectively used uh, across the nation. And uh, the history of science popularization in China is studied by some of my colleagues. Um, the most influential project is the citizen's scientific literacy. It's a survey and it's also an indicator study. And there is also comparative studies among the countries of the world, especially with India, Brazil, and America. Yeah. I think there are indicators follow the Jody Miller's indicator. Um, The resources for science communication is studied. Um, yeah, some of my colleagues are are undertaking a research about public's need for science communication, how to co-build and co-use the science resources, and uh, I, and the facilities for science popularization. There is a yearbook. Uh, about the science popularization facilities published every year annually. And the seventh is my, my, the, it, it's the work I am focusing on. That was evaluation. It's the evaluation assessment on both the uh, science communication events and the programs. Uh, I have been uh, in charge of the assessment projects of National Science Day and the Beijing Science Day for about four years. Yeah. And uh, also the studies on innovative in imagination of youth are carried out. Yeah, that was a project, I think, uh, collaborating with we launched by the professor I mentioned as well. Um, studies on science writings and the science works are carried out too. Uh, we have a survey about the science communication works in China, and uh, we want to uh, explore what, what people need, what kind of things they need, and the way also um, do research about uh, the writing skill of science communication works and uh, how to promote the science writing in the whole societies. They get funds, they get funds from CAST and uh, give these funds to the science writers. So some of the careers research has served the, the relevant department of government in making policies regarding science popularization. So I, I think I should have um, put the example here. I, the, the very the famous one is um, a policy about 
reinforced the size communication in minority areas was, was made. That basic research was undertaken by Chris. And now Chris is doing another big thing that's about, uh, we want to uh, give our suggestions to government to, um, to issue a law about scientists should put their effort to science communication when they get funds from the government for their scientific research. Yeah, it's pretty precise. Well, we, Chris also has some public resources like a by man's journal, Science Popularization, it's a Chinese journal. And uh, this is our website. And uh, we have CFI China newsletter. And uh, we have China report of Science Popularization. It's a yearbook published annually. Yeah, this is the conference Chris uh, sponsor, sponsored. The first one is conference of the theory of science popularization. Now it became an international conference. Some of the scholars from America, from the United Kingdom, came to attend our conference. Also the PCSP. We are the one of the co-sponsors. It was held every two years. I think the the next conference will held in Italy next year. So that's uh, about my institute. Now I will share my work and my reflections on science communication in China. Yeah, I am focusing on two, two directions. One is the assessment of science communication events, and the other one is studies on how to take use of resources in scientific research in, into science popularization. Yes. Mm. About the second project, I'm in charge of a funding project. We get funds from the CAST and uh, uh, give the funds to many societies and associations. And uh, they, um, they invited the scientists to, to um, To give me a word. No, you land. No, you land. They they just make make many things for science popularization. They make science research results easy to understand than use as a science communication. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I can't find a, a good word for that. Also, I'm interested in scientists' attitude towards science communication. It's the truth that in China, most of the scientists think that their job is to do scientific research. Science communication is not my compulsory job. So they have the pressure from promotion, from, uh, from other things. So they, they are not, um, they are not very like, they are not likely to do science communications much. So I think that's a problem. I'm thinking about whether they can find a way to attract attract scientists to do science communication work. So I want to undertake a survey first. Maybe this idea is not very new. I know that in Sweden they have a similar project. They they um, they find out uh, the attitudes of scientists towards science communication by interviews. Yeah, I think I 
Yeah, I learned things from them, but I think the, this story in China will be different yeah, because they, they have different contexts. Uh, yeah, I will talk a little bit, a little more about my assessment project. Yeah, this is the aims of an um, assessment. I think assessment for science communication events and the projects are very important because every project, every event will cost lots of money, cost lots of resources, whether they are effective, whether they obtain their set goals. That's very important to know. That's a good way to find the shortcomings and to better on them in the future. So I choose this theory. Um, so the methods are, are, are used widely, like questionnaire, interview, statistic, and observation. Yeah, we assessment of science communication event from different angles, like the public, because public is the, the target group of the event. Uh, the professional persons, like some specialists from science communication field, from science education, or from from the the theme of the science communication event, like uh, the theme of the science day of 2011. This year, it's coming in September is water. So I think I will invite some specialists or scientists from the field of water research. Yeah. Also. We undertake our assessment from the angle of volunteers and organizers. It's like a self-assessment of this group. Also the media report. Because, because we think that a, a science communication event only takes place in one place in a certain time and only a certain amount of number of public can come and attend. It should have this social influence. It should make the, the people who are not there know about science. So I think the media report is important. So every year we do assessment on this. I, after, so from the results of the assessment on the media report, we can get some information and make suggestions to the organizers to better up their media report program. There are, there are only two publications in English about my assessment work. But there are several in Chinese. <laughs> the first one is, uh, it will be published in September. That's a book that uh, collaborates between China and India. Oh, now it comes to the reflection on science communication in China. It's my opinion. The first one is science communication to farmers is of the most significant place. We all know that China has a large population of farmers. And compared to the other group of people like, um, like people in cities, the farmers' scientific literacy are relatively Lower. So, if we want to improve the whole nation's scientific literacy, we must improve the farmers' scientific literacy. And I think the resources for science, scientific communication in China are unbalanced in cities and uh, rural areas. Usually, they don't have museums and they don't have many libraries, they don't get many access to science information. So we should put more efforts to science communication in China, uh, in, in, in rural areas of China. Yeah. The 
Second is, there is an urgent need to meet the school education and the museum, uh, the, the outside school education. I, I, I mainly mean museum um, by outside school education. Um, I have been to some of other countries like United Kingdom, like Sweden, like America. And I noticed that, and not only me noticed it, many people know that the museum education and school education are combined very well in internationally, but not in China. Yeah. So I think museum is a very good place for for students to learn science. But now it's not very in very good situation in China. So I think there I think the school education and the outside school education can meet something. It's really better. And the third, yeah, I think more evaluation of science authorization than the program should be undertaken. So the reason I have, I have explained just now, it's very important. It's a way to avoid the waste of money and resources. Last, mass media is the most important way for science authorization. And journalists should be trained to be more qualified for science communication. Yeah. Mass media is very important in science communication. This made it the truth that journalists are important. Well, in China, I think some journalists are not qualified enough to be a science communicator. They need the quality to report science more accurately. They need a, a duty to, to report science more objectively, not, not exaggerating it, just to attract people. So that was my brain reflection on science communications in China. So I, yeah, I will stop here for my presentation. Yeah, because time is limited. Thank you for your attention. And I would please to answer your questions. to see the first robotics or the Lego League competition, how we've inspired science and technology through Dean Kamen. It was on, actually on national news on Sunday night on ABC for the first time. They used mass media to show how kids were engaged in project based In China? No, this was around the world. This was oh. the, the global competition which was on Sunday night in St. Louis. And I'd been involved with Dean Kamen to inspire kids to try to improve how they got kids to collaborate and mentor each other across different rural and inner city. Have you had a chance to see how that's been done in the United States, the yeah. first robotics? The, the multimedia is widely used in, in science communication events uh, in, in cities, and children are very interested in it. And, uh, the First time. robotics. Your robotics. It's a robotic competition. Does China have a robotic competition? Do you have robotic. Do you get involved oh, first? Yeah, the high school kid. You know, middle school kid. Uh, yeah, first, we have a first robotic competition. Do so, so, you get involved with first? Do you, do you have students? Do you? No. Oh. Okay. So, Yeah, I, as I mentioned just now, this article is about 
how did an exhibition influence children on on their uh, on their new points about innovations? And uh, also in this paper, I I mentioned about three assessments. The first one is about uh, how students get educate, educated from an uh, exhibition of low carbon. And the uh, second one is about how students change their, uh, how students were influenced by an uh, exhibition of Innovations. Uh, I, I, think, I think, I think the question that she was asking is, do you have any statistics yeah, to do. show how, for example, since 1980s and 1990s, there's been the influence of science popularization on the number of Chinese students who become involved in science? Uh, we have uh, it's, it's, uh, the citizens' uh, scientific literacy was surveyed every two years. Uh, that shows uh, how the scientific literacy improved uh, in China. But yeah, we, we have target group like students, but that I mean. Um, what makes the scientific literacy improve is not only the science communication, there's also the factor of school education. So these two, school education and the science communication, outside school education is not separated in this survey. intellectual property laws on intellectual property, but so far we don't have have the quiz and the cast don't have the I mean they don't all um,
I found your presentation very interesting. And I think we Westerners can learn a lot from uh, what you are doing in both areas, not just in science, but also in the humanities. Science does not belong to the scientists, and the humanities don't belong to the professors of philosophy at the, at the, at the, at the liberal arts colleges. If I understand it correctly, from the early years on, when the early emperors, when they issued their communications at the Chinese New Year, they communicated what they thought were the most important issues in science, uh, instructed by the Son of the Heaven, that would be how to live a healthy lifestyle, that means health of the farmers, and secondly, detailed information about agriculture, uh, how, how, to, how to grow crops, but also how, do it, how to do it in a very sustained way, yeah. so environmental. Yeah. So I assume if you go next year and do a, a conference and outreach on water, you probably will go back to Taoist teaching and come up with a lot of quotes from the Taoist king on the harmony of people. Of course, the, the Son of Heaven had, had, had the goal when he talked about harmony with the crops and with the land and with the people and the harmonious society, because he didn't want revolution, of course. Uh, you can do better by living in harmony with your neighbors and with the land than doing revolution. So that was that was an additional aspect of the, of, the, of the emperor, of course. But I think we in the West, we haven't connected yet, even though we had the centuries of enlightenment in Europe, we haven't really connected into the, the, the public to science, nor to humanity. I remember in 1980, uh, at Beijing University, they already had back their Department of Western Philosophy. They studied Kusal, Heidegger, Kant, and Aristotle. So I said, what about the Chinese Philosophy Department? And they said, we don't need it. We never had it. They learned it with the milk from the mother. Of course, it was an excuse. Uh, they had Tao, Maoism, and Stalinism, and, and, and Marxism, of course. So they didn't have a very strong department in the history of Chinese philosophy. But the excuse made a good point. Philosophy was part of the culture. Philosophy belongs to the people. Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and the, even in the absence of philosophy professor at Beijing University, they got it with the milk from the mouth. <laughs> so I think we can learn something from this approach. And I learned from the department. But you people in the Department of History of Organization of Science, they would know about the Emperor's uh, New Year letters and the communication. They did. I noticed, because I, I share your survey and interview methods, that we worked with Beijing Noble University years ago, mm -hmm. back in the early 90s, to evolve a collaboration system in, in Mandarin, and probably in Cantonese now. But it would allow people to collaborate globally. And those tools have evolved to the point today where they're in 30 different languages. And in fact, when you had the disasters that happened in China, those resources were deployed, and there was a, an openness to collaborate and share extensively to help respond to the disaster. Is there interest today in evolving some of those humanitarian collaboration tools that are used to share when there's a disaster? Because sometimes out of necessity comes innovation. And so in the United States today, I work with experimentations to humanitarian assistance because ultimately sometimes people come up with innovative ways to sustain when there's no power, there's no water, and there's nothing. So we, we are evolving a 
experimentation that uh, I'm hoping to exchange with other countries. Right now, it's just mostly in the U.S. and we uh, events that we share with other countries and embassies come down. That this would be in the first week in October here in D.C. But I'm thinking those kinds of things are the where are areas where the global community shares a common interest in seeing innovation come in to understand what is sustainable for your culture when they experience certain disasters. Because you know, some countries have volcanoes, others have earthquakes, others have floods. So it, it, it does depend on the environment and very much like that. So that would be something I, you know, I'd share that I think you could collaborate more. There are resources in China now to en en enable students and scientists to collaborate in China, Chinese, but also chat in other different languages like German. Yeah, I think Chris is a little would love to collaborate with an uh, organization with the uh, same interest in Russia. Okay. One more question? One more question. Yeah. Uh, communicating with non literacy people, do you use comics or narratives uh, to communicate uh, rather than? Uh, written language. I remember Chinese friends told me something like uh, green, black, white. Now that means for health, for nutrition. Green is the China kale, black is this mushroom, this fungus, and white I forgot. It's another vegetable. White. So it's a mnemotechnic. If I say green, blue, white, and the teacher says green, blue, white, green, blue, white, that means eat China curry and eat the, this mushroom, eat this and this. So I don't know what it stands for, I forgot. You use this technique, yes, this form of communication like uh, 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 comics, It's widely used because uh, it, uh, the difference between scientific research and scientific <coughs> communication is to make things easy to understand, to learn, to accept. So such techniques Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks also to Dr. John Shook for providing us with this wonderful opportunity. And thank you for that presentation. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, as always, all of our events are open and free to all of you. We have one this Thursday you may be interested in also. That's Neurocognitive Sciences in National Security, Intelligence, and Defense. That's all day Thursday, begins 8 o'clock in the morning, so if you have an interest, please, the event is open and free, and as always, we serve food and we have a wine and cheese reception after that. One more big round of applause for our <laughs> And thanks to all of you, Susan. Wonderful. Wonderful. Outstanding. Yeah. 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 Ye